try to keep what I'm doing. Thank you so much. So, uh, first, I would like to thank all of you uh, for coming out on a Friday at 9.30. I imagine you might have had other things to do. Um, but I really appreciate that. Um, so, you know, work is dialogical, so I'm interested to see what you guys think about some of these ideas. I'd like to thank uh, Franklin Humanities Institute, particularly Ranji Khan, for inviting me to be part of this. I'd like to thank Sarah Rogers for all the work she's done to make this event make this event possible. Um, let me just say a little bit um, about where this project is coming from. Let's say kind of just two sources. One is, after my first book, Hope, Faith, and Black, I kept getting the question, how is this religious studies, right? I just seems, I can see how it's, it's, it's a literature project, black studies project, where's the religion, right? And so since then, I've also been teaching a theorizing religion course in my department, and I've been thinking about how uh, the ambivalence of the sacred how the sacred can be a stand-in or a placeholder for order and cohesion and purity, but also the sacred can be right a signifier for contamination, right excess and anguish. Right? You see that that doubleness of the sacred in, in, in and I'm sorry, in, in Emil Durkheim's work. Right? I think Bataille goes one way, and I think Eliade goes another. And I'm suggest I want to suggest in this in, in this, um, this paper, Fanon and Winter, who are not usually right, uh, examine that closely in religious studies as something right to offer for thinking about what I call the volatile sacred in connection with the poetics, literature, and so on. So, um, the second uh, source is um, conversations with J. Cameron Carter. Um, so we uh, co-taught a course last semester, How Blackness Thinks. So I want to thank him. You know, many ways this, 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 this paper emerges from the conversation with him, but also with the students, very much with the students in that class, some of them who are here right now. So here we go. Race, religion, and coloniality make up a violent constellation implications of which religious studies is still only beginning to confront. Scholars have demonstrated how modern conceptions of religion emerge alongside the collisions between Europe and the darker denizens of modernity. As David Chedester points out in his analysis of colonial encounters in southern Africa and elsewhere, early modern uh, European missionaries and settlers assumed that blacks and, and Indians lacked, Native Americans lacked religion, an assumption that, quote, called into question the humanity of Europe's external others. To not have religion, or more specifically, to exist outside of the European Christian fold, signified an absence of those qualities that distinguish humans from other species, law, order, political structure, and so forth. This imaginary justified conquest and settler projects in the name of giving law to anarchic populations. In response to this predicament, Nelson Maldonado Torres claimed that, quote, the concept of religion is intimately linked with the modern concept of race, and both play a role in the formation of modernity slash coloniality. To put it succinctly, Race and religion are co-constitutive in determining who counts and who doesn't count as human. <clears throat> One significant aspect of religious life is the fabrication of sacred value and the endeavor to protect sacred objects from violation, from being profaned. The sacred is typically set apart by taboos and prohibition, uh, prohibitions as a special domain that generates value, order, and cohesion. Consequently, the, the sacred needs to be buffered from entities that threaten to introduce disorder and contamination. Since black bodies and people of color have been marked by modern arrangements as signifiers of disorder and death, the logic of the sacred profane is intimately bound up with coloniality, race, and anti-blackness. In what follows, I extend the work on religion, race, and colonization by sharpening attention to a particular understanding of the sacred that underwrites and legitimates the colonial imaginary. To accomplish this, I return to the work of Chea Eliada. Although Eliada has been dismissed by commentators for being ahistorical and uncritical, his distinction between the sacred and profane, which maps onto the distinction between being and non-being, or legible world and chaotic space, continues to illumine the complicity between sacrality and colonial terror. In order to flesh out the dangers of Eliade's uh, framework, dangers that he glosses over, I turn to the work of Franz Fanon and Sylvia Winter. While these authors are not as widely read in religious studies, I, can, I contend that the reflection of colonization and anti-blackness rely on an implicit critique of the grammar of the sacred found in Eliade's account of religion. I conclude the essay, by I conclude the essay by showing that Fanon's writing, particularly the style of black skin, white masks, gestures toward an alternative sense of the sacred, a volatile sacred that departs from the logics of settlement and possession. So, am, I, am I going too fast? Or I said, I don't know. I'm a mom in my mind. Eliada and the world establishing sacred. <clears throat> Machia Eliada's understanding of religion relies on a strong distinction between sacred and profane space and religious and secular man. While the contrast does not always hold, it does provide insights into the kinds of imaginaries that propel coloni coloniality or colonization in its afterlife. Borrowing from Rudolf Otto, 
Eliade contends that sacred space is made possible by an interruption of the holy other into the natural world. This manifestation of the sacred, made possible by the world-creating work of the gods, introduces a break into what would otherwise be homogeneous space. Sacred space is made possible by a rupture, a, qual a qualitative division within the space continuum, enabling religious people to experience that space as separate and unique. As Eliade writes, quote, there is then a sacred space and hence a strong significant space there are other spaces that are not sacred, so without structure or consistency, amorphous. A religious man in spatial non-homogeneity finds expression in the experience of an opposition between space that is sacred, the only real and really existing space, and other space, the formless expanse surrounding it." End quote. In Mary Douglas's language, we might read Eliade saying that a hierophany, or an appearance of the sacred, enables the opposition between space that is coherent and meaningful and space that symbolizes dirt and chaos. More strongly, the appearance of the sacred, quote, ontologically founds the world, end quote, and reveals an absolute fixed point, a center, that orients religious people. At the center of the world, an expression of the real, the sacred is, quote, power, efficacity, the source of life, and fecundity. For Eliada, sacred experience provides the, uh, provides the conditions for participating in being, for escaping illusion, and the threat of irrelevance. Eliada consistently contrasts the qualities of the sacred structure, foundation, reality, being, with the, with the characteristics of the profane, chaos, formlessness, lack. There seems to be an ontological distinction between the two kinds of spaces and consequently between religious and non-religious experience. Yet, Eliyahu also suggests that there is some continuity between sacred and profane experience. When he mentions uh, non-religious people who treat certain places, birthplace, right, for, uh, first city one visits, as extraordinary and set apart from the mundane. He also interprets various secular ph philosophies such as Marxism, is unconsciously invested in religious themes like redemption, class and society, and the collective messiah, proletariat. In addition, he acknowledges that for humans to access, to, to assess the sacred, uh, to access the sacred, to have a religious experience, hierophanies must occur through profane objects and spaces. Consequently, Eliade identifies various thresholds, like a door to a temple, the top of a mountain, or a ritual that indicate a passage from the profane to the sacred domain. As he puts it, the threshold is the limit, the boundary, frontier that distinguishes and opposes two worlds, and at the same time, the paradoxical uh, place where those worlds communicate, where passage from the profane to the sacred world becomes possible. While this notion of the threshold suggests a more fluid relationship between the sacred and the profane, this fluidity is superseded by a designation of the sacred as that which establishes order over and against figures of profanity. One way that humans communicate with the gods is by participating in the creative work of the gods an activity that involves the consecration of space and the construction of worlds. According to Eliade, quote, the ritual by which man constructs a sacred space is efficacious in the measure in which he reproduces the work of the gods. One such ritual or liturgy that he mentioned is the occupation of foreign land by a world or a community that has already been ordered and organized by the sacred. If the sacred, quote, fixes the limits and establishes the order of the world, end quote, it does this by opposing and engulfing territories and populations that embody chaos. Eliade writes, quote, an unknown foreign, unoccupied territory, and he says, which often means un unoccupied by our people, still shares in the fluid and larval mod modality of chaos. By occupying it, and above all, by settling in it, man symbolically transforms into a cosmos through a ritual repetition of the cosmogony. Eliade offers the example of Spanish and Portuguese conquistadors taking possession of Native American territory in the name of the cross. By planting the cross and the flag on foreign territory, this consecrating liturgy converts chaos into form, fluidity, fluidity into solidity, uncultivated space into, in, into habitable land, and death into life. This transforming practice creates a world that can be possessed, occupied, and settled on. And the violence involved in this kind of colonial project is disavowed by the colonizer in the name of creating and giving new life. Within Eliade's grammar of the sacred and profane, quote, settling in a new territory is equivalent to founding a world and reenacting the original creation of the gods. Settlement is a terrifying ritual that purportedly transforms profane space into the sacred world. The process, and in the process, the human settler becomes something like a divine power. He's making an argument about participation, right? The human participates in the divine precisely through founding worlds, settling territory. One might dismiss the, co the cosmos uh, chaos binary that underwrites Eliade's idea of the sacred and the related grammar of settlement and emblemat as emblematic of pre-modern pre-modern myths, especially myths that narrated the beginning of time with God slaying monsters and dragons in order to establish the world. On this reading, the colonial conquest is modeled after creation stories that secular reason has abandoned. 
But Eliana anticipates this move. He reminds the reader that the monsters that need to be slayed in ancient myths, especially the sea monster, are embodiments of, quote, darkness, death, and night. The monster represents everything that has not acquired a form. Consequently, secular thought continues to be committed to something like the sacred profane distinction, insofar as it identifies certain bodies as signifiers of ruin, destruction, disintegration, and death, as threats to the civilized world. Insofar as prevailing practices and arrangements mark certain kinds of populations and territories as harbingers of disorder, as embodiments of the monsters. Eliade has his finger on something here, but uh, Eliade has his finger on something here, but does not develop a devastating insight. Sacredness, which is reproduced by projects of settlement, is anti-black. Here the term black following Fred Moten refers not just to black people, but more generally to quote, disordering deformational forces that are indispensable to normative order, normative form. In line with the work of the historian of religion Charles Long, whose work is a direct response to Eliada, we might say that the world founding sacred is opposed to but relies on opacity. Opacity for Long alludes to red and black peoples, <laughs> this is language, indigenous Americans and kidnapped Africans, populations that make up the traumatic kernel of American religious history. At the same time, the language of the opaque signifies that which frustrates and escapes the world's transparency or the yearning for stable distinctions, borders, and meanings. The opaque represents a kind of muddiness that threatens to unravel rigid boundaries and normative forms. The opaque is what the project of settlement attempts to contain, transform, or impose form on, and eliminate. While Eliada briefly describes how the sacred profane framework accompanies and justifies colonial missions, he does not linger or tarry with the implications. In other words, he does not reflect on the constitutive relationship between the enactment, of the, sacred, the enactment of the sacred or the procedures of settling erstwhile uninhabitable territory and what Paul Gilbert alludes, alludes to as the terror of modernity. Consequently, he does not underscore how his understanding of the sacred is tethered to imaginaries and practices that rank order peoples and lands, that position Europe and America as the sanctified sources of power, life, and being. To put it differently, Eliade's reflections gesture toward a predicament in which whiteness is considered sacred and blackness is associated with the dangers of profanity and a potential violation of bodies and spaces set apart as more valuable and more in touch with life and being. Perhaps because Eliade is so focused on reviving religiosity and a sense of transcendence in a secular age, he cannot sit with the underside of the sacred and its operations. And while Eliade acknowledges how a commitment to the redemptive sacred, or that which gives life to signifiers of death, is evident in religious and secular man, we might say that there is, some, there is more continuity than Eliade notices between these two personas, especially as it relates to the darker denizens of modernity. When Eliade claims, quote, a religious man expresses a desire to live in a pure and holy cosmos as it was in the beginning when it came fresh from the creator's hands, we should acknowledge that the will to purity gets rearticulated in secular thought and practice, colonial, regime, colonial regimes, and racial logics. When it comes to the world establishing sacred, religious and secular man are often two sides of the same colonial anti-black home. To flesh out an insight that Eliade refuses to expand on, I turn to the work of Sylvia Winter and Franz Fanon. Winter, Fanon, and the of Man. Sylvia Winter and Franz Fanon implicitly respond to the kind of religious imaginary articulated by Eliade, one in which the production of sacred space is closely tied to settling territory, occupying foreign land, and containing the, the opaque. By thinking with these authors, we see how Eliade's sacred profane distinction underwrites European colonial frameworks and maps onto what Du Bois calls color lines, <coughs> the, hier the hierarchical division between whites and blacks, uh, and Europeans and non-Europeans. While Winter offers a geneal genealogical account of these sacred divisions, Fanon provides a more existential account of the enticements of the sacred for black subjects who yearn to be inducted into the sphere of the human. For Winter, the long-lasting hierarchies and divisions within modernity are largely the result of a particular conception of the human, European man, becoming the totalizing image of humanity. From the late 15th century to the present, European conceptions of what and who is, what, uh, what and who is human have dominated and excluded other ways of imagining the human. As Catherine uh, McKittrick points out, Winter uh, endeavors to represent the fullness of human ontologies, which have been curtailed by what she describes as an over-representation of man, uh, parentheses, Western bourgeoisie man, as if it, he, were the only available mode of complete humanness. In the effort to reinvent the human, Winter unsettles the ground that equates the human with man, a conflation that has implications for race, class, and gender arrangements. Or to put it differently, Winter exposes how certain visions and expressions of the human have become settled in opposition to bodies and territories that have come to signify a danger to settlement and that could constitute the necessary occasions for colonial and settler projects. In the process, Winter shows how this <coughs> opposition or division relies on religious language and an enduring commitment to something like the sacred. In her well-known essay, Unsettling the Coloniality of Being, Power, Truth, Freedom, there's other 
long title, I'll just say. <laughs> From now, I'll just say Unsettling the Coloniality of Being, Power, Truth, Freedom. Winter traces different stages of Western man, showing how each stage is a kind of rearticulation of religious and theological paradigms and imaginaries. For Winter, the Christian distinction between spirit and fallen flesh, and the related distinction between the redeemed and unredeemed, gets extended into the early modern era, or the age of European discovery. She writes, the series of symbolically coded spirit flesh, spirit slash flesh representations mapped onto the space of otherness of the physical cosmos had not only functioned to absolutize the theocentric descriptive statement of the human, its master coded symbolic life, the spirit and death, the flesh, it had also served to absolutize a general order of existence together with the postulate of significant ill, whose mode of affliction and logically calls a, this is all one sentence, I promise, logically calls the particular plan of salvation or redemptive cure able to cure the specific ill that threatened all subjects of the order in order to redeem them from its threat of annihilation, negation that is common to all religions. We can talk about the form and style of her writing too at some point. I think it's, very, I think it's, I think it's actually intentional and very important. As this passage suggests, the contrast between spirit and flesh has something to do with the stable separation between life and death, cure and sickness, redeemed and unredeemed, the flesh is associated with separability, scattering, and excess. As Myra Rivera puts it, quote, flesh is an ambivalent term that names a rather slippery materiality. Flesh is conceived as formless and impermanent, crossing the boundaries between the individual body and the world. While spirit can mean many things, when it is often opposed to flesh, it typically represents unity and coherence. It marks a kind of elevation above and a disciplining of the dissipating qualities and desires associated with fleshliness. Thus, Winter contends that the spirit-flesh demarcation operates to construct a general order of existence Within Western Christianity, especially during the Age of Discovery, this schema includes a distinction between the heavens and vile and base matter, clergy and laity, redeemed and unredeemed, and inhabitable and uninhabitable territory. Some populations, including Africans and Native Americans, get associated with fallen flesh that requires redemption, while respective, ter while respective territories such as Africa and the Americas were considered unlivable apart from the settling activities of missionaries and colonizers. Regions and populations associated with too much heat excessive water or wasted natural resources become figures of non-being and occasions for redemption via occupation. What is crucial for Winter is that the separation between spirit and flesh and redeemed Christian and unredeemed other gets re-expressed through racial language within the framework of colonial modernity. She writes, quote, in the wake of the West's reinvention of its true Christian self and the transmuted terms of the rational self of man, however, it was to be the peoples of militarily, again, one sentence, militarily expropriated new world territories, i.e. Indians, as well as the enslaved peoples of black Africa, i.e. Negroes, they were made to reoccupy the matrix slot of otherness, to be made into the physical referent of the idea of the irrational, subrational human other. Here the language of transmutation and reoccupy suggests that a general schema of division and separation merely got reinvented, <clears throat> with, with rational man taking the place of the true Christian, and a rational Native American and subhuman black assuming the position of the infidel, or idolatry. Alongside this shift, the evangelizing mission of the church <coughs> transformed into and existed alongside, quote, the imperializing mission of the state based on its territorial expansion and conquest. This transformation was enabled by an analogy between the obedient Christian subject to ecclesial authority and the rational European self subordinate to the laws of the state. European man, an offspring of the true Christian self, emerges as the site of order and reason while non-European signify wildness, disorder, and the undefinable space between animal and human. Consequently, the latter must be contained, disciplined, and civilized by the former, the idea of European civilization sublates and retains the Christian logic of salvation. It might seem as if Winter's story is a bit too linear and abstract. We'll talk about that as well. <clears throat> Similarly, it could be argued that her story does not allow for differences between the church and the state, theology and politics, or differences within right, Christianity, and so forth. While these concerns are valid, they do not take away from her general claim that a particular way of carving up the earth, right, of imagining non-homogeneity, propels and justifies violence against those on the stigmatized side of the division. This grammar of non-homogeneity, according to Winter, sneaks into religious and secular paradigms, is a part of Christianity and the secular religion of man. And as uh, Maldonado Torres points out, this division, especially within the modern context, is ontological. Western man completely participates in being, while blacks and others, other non-conforming peoples exist at the edges of being and non-being. Man is positioned in the privileged space of capacity, power, life, and endurance, while black flesh is the site of both lack and excess, death and instability. Here we should recall Eliade's claims about the intersection of religion and ontology. He writes, the religious need of living in a sacred world expresses an unquenchable ontological thirst. Religious man thirsts for being. His terror of the chaos that surrounds his inhabited world corresponds to the terror of nothingness. I mean, when I'm reading this, I'm just like, oh my god, this is, right? This, and I'm reading Moten, I'm like, oh, anyway, right? It's just like the, 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 the uh, screams for uh, conversation. The thirst for being is to yearn for a secure position in the world 
in opposition to looming figures and signifiers of terror and nothingness. This desire involves fabricating rigid distinctions and borders, exemplified in the economy of the sacred or in the color line, in an effort to prevent embodiments of terror from infiltrating zones of being. <clears throat> Consequently, the strong distinction between being and chaos justifies projects of terror by the agents of being, projects that are touted as gift, mission, civilizing, defense, or spreading democracy. The religion of man and his thirst for being is terrifying. Winter anticipates the kind of argument that would accuse her of focusing on a particular phase of man from the early period of modernity, the 15th to 18th centuries, which she calls man one. This phase includes the image of Western bourgeoisie man that resembles Descartes' cogito, which is defined by its ability to represent the world in conformity with reason, with a Kantian subject that is characterized as a self-legislating source of reason, morality, and value. Some might argue that, the, that these philosophical moments are indebted to an old pre-Darwinian metaphysics attached to permanence and stability as conditions for truth. So if you're familiar with American pragmatism, this is kind of John Dewey's, this is John Dewey's um, argument in his essay, right, on like the recovery, recovery of philosophy through Darwin. He, wants, he would suggest that most, most philosophy, you know, up until pragmatism, right, is, 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 is committed to something like permanence and stability, but Darwin bring, introduces a kind of revolution. Spil um, sorry, Winter is already kind of anticipating it. Darwin's ideas on this reading introduce the primacy of contingency, variation, and uncertainty in human experience qualities which refuse the image of man and his dualisms. Yet as Winter points out, Darwin's thought repeats the dividing strategy as it makes a strong distinction between the selected and deselected within the process of human evolution. <clears throat> According to Winter, quote, this principle, that of bioevolutionary natural selection, was now to function at the level of the new bourgeoisie social order as a de facto new argument from design, one in which one's selected or deselected status could not be known in advance, could come to be verified by one's group's success or failure in life. Perhaps what is so insidious about Darwin's idea of natural selection is that over time the term natural conceals the fact that this is a reinvention of the human, a new way of carving up populations in terms of the livable and unlivable. This division between the selected and deselected would be embodied in the color line and used to justify, quote, the instituted relationship of socioeconomic dominance, subordination between the lighter and the darker peoples of the earth, end quote. This demarcation, this dark, this, I'm sorry, this demarcation is another mode of subordinating non-Europeans to man and a further way of reinstituting the sacred. I know there are other ways of reading Darwin. As with Bruce would suggest. By supplementing, by, by supplementing Eliade's religious thought with Winter's diagnosis of colonial modernity, I have shown that I've tried to show that man is a product of various binaries and divisions that resemble the separation between the sacred and profane, livable, unlivable, inhabitable, un I'm sorry, uninhabitable, habitable, spirit, flesh, and being, non-being. Man, according to this framework, consecrates the world through territorial expansion through quote. African enslavement, Latin American conquest, and Asian subjugation, end quote. Or we can consider the settlement of territory for quasi-religious literature for the colonizer. Franz Fanon suggests that the colonized also participate in rituals that involve an imaginary passage from the profane to the sacred. In his influential text, Black Skin, White Mask, Fanon provides a powerful account of the lived experience of blackness under the regime of Western man. While it is well known that Fanon uses clinical and psychoanalytic categories to diagnose the effects of the colonial encounter, particularly between France and its Caribbean and African colonies, he uses religious grammar as well. Think, for instance, of an earlier remark in the introduction. There is a zone of non-being, of, extra, of, of extraordinarily sterile and arid region, um, an inclined, strict bearer of every essential form, which a genuine new departure can emerge. In most cases, the black man cannot take advantage of this descent into a veritable hell. The image of descending into hell involves a prior position above death, non-being, and the abyss, this assumes that hell is a possibility rather than an ontological condition, with a lot of those whose exclusion from the realm of being is a precondition for ontology. For Fanon, the colonial framework places blacks in a situation of perpetual violence, suffering, and wretchedness. It produces a hell that blacks do not have a privilege to descend to, like the dialectical thinker or avant-garde artist, in order to create and produce something new. Fanon continues to read the condition of the black through religious tropes in his discussion of language and coloniality. In this discussion, these tropes help to explain the enticements of man, the attractions of, the attractions of being recognized as fully human, and the transformations that supposedly accompany this recognition. For Fanon, quote, we must attach a fundamental importance to the phenomenon of language, in part because, quote, the more the black Antillian assimilates the French language, the whiter he gets, i.e., the closer he becomes to being a true <coughs> human being. By possessing language, the colonized subject begins to possess or secure a position in French civilization, the metropolitan culture, the realm of being, but of course this process of becoming human requires the black to reject and abandon those aspects of her culture, such as dialects and vernacular, that cannot be assimilated into the civilizing movement. 
The more the colonized has assimilated the cultural values of the metropolis, he says, the more he will have escaped the bush. The more he rejects his blackness in the bush, the whiter he will become. Here for known gestures toward Du Bois' understanding of double consciousness, a term that the latter uses to describe the condition of blacks in the United States. Among other things, double consciousness names a peculiar sensation, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on with amused contempt and pity. What Fanon and Du Bois are getting at is a certain cut in Hegel's notion of mutual recognition. Within the framework of anti-black racism, black bodies are compelled to imitate values and modes of being that are central to maintaining an anti-black framework. To learn proper French, he says, to become a subject worthy of recognition requires one to suppress those aspects of blackness that are looked on with, quote, contempt and pity. Induction into the human sphere demands a kind of self-alienation and M slash possible separation from one's black flesh. In Fanon's context, this duplicity is experienced especially by those who travel from the Caribbean right, to Europe. The aforementioned distinction between metropolis and bush, developed metropole and backward colony, is an extension of Eliade's contrast between legible world at the center of the earth and opaque territory located in the hinterland. By crossing this divide, by passing from the Antilles to France, the black takes on a new character, a new relationship to being and life. Fanon writes, quote, the black man who has been to the metropole as a demigod. After a fairly long stay in the metropole, many Antillians return home to be deified. The black man who has lived in France for a certain time returns home radically transformed. It means a sense of irony and facetiousness and rhetorical excess here, but I'm interested in the religious language that he's using. By becoming a demigod still uh, below the sanctified status of man, the elevated black creates an aura of magic around himself, he says. An aura that uh, creates both disdain and awe in other blacks. This transformation attests to the fact that the colonizing country is treated as the, quote, holy of holies, unquote, while the culture of the colonized people, quote, has been committed to the grave. As I take it, Fanon is identifying the rites of initiation that promise a conversion from the wretched to the human, from a figure of death to the subject of new life. These rites include language acquisition and a pilgrimage from uncivilized territories to the centers of the colonial world. In Eliade's language, these rites enable a passage from the profane to the sacred. But this enticing religious passage would always be complete because David Marriott points out in his reading of Fanon, blackness is the settled world's aberration. The task now is to develop a notion of the sacred and religiosity that is faithful to that aberration. Okay. Two thirds of the way there, probably, right? <laughs> the other sacred and Fononian poetics. In the same way that Western man does not exhaust our understanding of the human, the world establishing sacred, right, or the settling sacred, that underwrites coloniality and anti-black racism, does not completely determine how we can imagine and perform the sacred. As Jeremy Biles points out, there is an ambivalence intrinsic to the notion of the sacred. With a nod to Emile Durkheim and George Bataille, Biles distinguishes between the right-hand sacred that involves form and purity, and the left-hand sacred, which is opaque, formless, and ecstatic. The left hand sacred prompts an engagement with qualities like unsettlement, unsettlement, anguish, and volatility, the necessary flip side of projects of territorial possession and expansion. Perhaps Eliade provides resources for thinking about this alternative religiosity. religiosity. Recall that Eliade draws from Otto's notion of the holy as a mysterious, awe inspiring, and terrifying power that exceeds the laws of reason. For Eliade, the manifestation of the sacred is an interruption into the ordinary, an interruption that makes, quote, man's sense as profound nothingness. By encountering the holy, Man experiences an identification with ashes and dust. Hence, the sacred, before becoming the vehicle of settlement and order, is a site of ambivalence, both awe and anguish, attraction, and repulsion. It is similarly an excess of form and coherence. In addition to this auto-inspired, auto-inspired, auto-inspired description of the holy, Eliade's notion of the threshold can be interpreted against the tendency to bifurcate right, the sacred and profane or settled world and formless territory. He admits, for instance, that the sacred necessarily manifests itself through the profane, and that the passage from one to the other, the threshold, is a paradoxical, paradoxical space of opposition and intimacy. Instead of reading the threshold as an occasion for form to be imposed on the opaque, perhaps the edge is what, perhaps the edge is that moment when reliable distinctions break down, when stable forms unravel, and when continuity interrupts the compulsion to be set apart and set things apart. In other words, what if we associated the sacred with passage, movement, the jagged edge, uh, intimacy, and deformation? And how is this version of the left-hand sacred related to blackness, decolonizing practices, and alternative forms of sociality? To read Eliade in this direction would bring him closer to an author like George Bataille, an author that Biles associates with the left-hand sacred. In Bataille's religious thought, the profane world is defined by instrumental reason, meaning-making, and pursuit of projects. The profane world is the world of things, in which humans separate themselves from other species and other humans through objectification. As beings invested in duration and self-preservation, humans treat the world as a toolbox, as an occasion to advance in further projects. 
In other words, human survival and endurance rely on treating others as objects and things that are subordinate to various ends and goals. Treating another as an object entails both horizontal and, horizontal and vertical distance. It results from seeing others as discontinu dis I'm sorry, discontinuous with ourselves. The sacred domain, on the other hand, is associated with intimacy and anguish, with encounters and experiences that interrupt investments in being coherent, durable selves. Sacred experiences such as mysticism, sexual activity, or festival momentarily restore the kind of continuity that humans both long for but cannot completely attain because of the very qualities that distinguish humans from animals, particularly self-consciousness or the commitment to being a discreet self. Bataille writes, quote, man is afraid of the intimate order that is not reconcilable with the order of things because man is not squarely within the intimate order but only partakes of it through a thing that is threatened in its nature. Um, in, in a, I'm sorry, in the project that constituted intimacy and the trembling of the individual body. I'm sorry, intimacy and the trembling of the individual is holy, sacred, and suffused with anguish. In other words, religious experience cuts against the fantasy of a coherent self or community, and the reason intimacy feels excessive and anguish filled is because, according to Bataille, humans always have one foot in the order of things, the profane world, the realm that sets the self or the collective apart and above others in the attempt to pursue projects. Unlike Winter, Bataille does not think through the relation, very much through the relationship between man and Europe, or how the self that he takes for granted is the product of dominant Western epistemes and imaginaries. At the same time, Bataille reminds us that any reinvention of the human, including Winter's endeavor, must take seriously the violence internal to projects and the general will to preservation. In other words, any project invested in futurity, goals, and the fulfillment of meaning will, to some extent, restrain those beings, entities, or desires that threaten the success of that project. Consequently, Bataille does not contend that humans can live outside of the order of things, the order of instrumental violence. Rather, he promotes the kinds of projects and practices that wound our very investment in duration and coherence. If the sacred is that which opens up the self to excess and anguish or to a level where clarity is no longer given, then we can only ex uh, access the sacred through the, uh, the everyday realm of language, grammar, aesthetics, etc. In addition to fiction, music, and film, one genre that expresses this imminent excess is poetry for Bataille. According to Bataille, I quote, if poetry introduces the strange, it does so by means of the familiar. The poetic is the familiar dissolving into the strange and ourselves with it, end quote. Here I take it that Bataille is making a connection between poetry and poetics, the latter being the more general study of the ways in which language and grammar operate in literature and on selves. Insofar as Bataille links the dissolution of the familiar <coughs> within poetry to the dissolution of the self, it's clear that he sees poetics as more than a literary strategy. Poetics for him is an ethical site a set of interactions, tensions, modes of being, and affective experiences that depart from the disavowed violence of settlement and stabilizing projects. Or to put it differently, poetics names a motive relating to the other, to the heterogeneous that aims for communication through wounds and cuts. For those black skin, white masks, particularly the style and form of the text, offers a powerful example of poetics being an expression, being an expression of the sacred that interrupts and overwhelms. As David Marriott points out, Fanon's thought enacts a poetics of dissolution that cannot be rendered intelligible by the frameworks of meaning that underwrite the current state of things. Recall that Fanon describes much importance to language as a vehicle of colonial power. The acquisition of French language by the colonized is a, site of is a rite of initiation into the hollow space of Western man. Within this process, language, like civilization, is something to be possessed and taken as property. Yet, Fanon also alludes to the poet and essayist Paul Valéry's claim that language is, quote, the god gone astray in the flesh. To go astray is to go off center, to deviate from the normal course, to approach or reach the flesh, as Winter suggests in her analysis of the spirit-flesh distinction, is to make a plunge into dark matter that lacks form and coherence. Fleshliness is both an indication of permeability and a slippery excess that cannot be fully contained by the language of by, by language or grammar, but that a certain way of using and arranging words can expose us to. What I'm suggesting here, I'm trying to suggest something in excess right, of grammar and language but that a certain way of arranging words right, can actually expose us or open us up to. As I demonstrate, Fanon's writing exemplifies the sacred gone astray, a sense of the sacred that remains faithful to the opacity and surplus of the flesh. He also shows how the language of the colonizer can be used against colonial strategies to express the dispossession and anguish that accompanies projects of possession and capture. Consider the style and format of By Way of Conclusion, the final chapter in Fanon's classic text. In this concluding section, Fanon combines essay, aphorism, stream of consciousness, and even prayer. He invites the reader into a succession of exclamations, declarations, self-realizations, and questions, a sequence that does not always cohere. He begins the section by anticipating, quote, I can already see the faces of those who will ask me to clarify such and such a point or condemn such and such a behavior. Here, Fanon is envisioning those who desire a conclusion that will resolve certain tensions or iron out the kinks in his diagnosis of anti-blackness and colonial trauma, like I'm sure some of you are like, 
Please hurry up and finish up. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Right. <laughs> these, might, these might be readers that, quote, <coughs> believe that the appeals of reason or respect for human dignity can change reality. Or at least reassure us that racial antagonisms can be overcome without struggle, force, and interruptions to the order of things. Interruptions that involve exposing the violence that goes unnamed in the affirmation of reason and humanity. For Fanon, this everyday violence against blacks is the result of an ossified society, a social world that is defined by congealed borders. Fanon attempts to poetically work within this ossified space to gesture towards something different, a gesture that involves taking the reader through a series of tensions, torsions, and cuts. The cut is both a wound and an opening. These tensions revolve around the relationship between past and future, self and other, and being and non-being. Regarding the modalities of time, Fanon seems to argue throughout the conclusion that the past does not determine the fu his future. At times, his rhetoric seems to mimic American optimism, as he claims that the density of history determines none of my acts, but that he has no interest in dwelling on the racial violence of the past. <clears throat> at the same time, he acknowledges that black cells are locked, to some extent, to a despised body that tons of change, that ton quote, tons of change, squalls of lashes, and rivers of spit stream over his shoulders, end quote. Here, the language of squall and river connote turbulence, and movement, the image of spit streaming alludes to the black body as a target of ejected excess and flow, and perhaps the violent intimacy between whites and blacks. By combining a history of cuts and wounds accumulated on black bodies with signifiers of mobility, flow, and turbulence, Fanon beckons the reader to think beyond a stark contrast between moving forward and looking backward. In fact, when he claims, in fact, when he claims that, quote, still today they are organizing dehumanization rationally, end quote, after alluding to black enslavement and white inhumanity, Fanon acknowledges that the past carries an afterlife that haunts the present and future. It is important to keep in mind that Fanon frequently sounds averse to gazing backward because the pre-colonial past can be treated as a point. In, in opposition to the pre-colonial past being treated as a privileged source of authenticity, meaning an Eliada-like purity. In response to this tendency to search for an unscathed origin or ground for blackness, Fanon writes, quote, but I have, the, I have not the right to put down roots. I have not the right to admit the slightest patch of being into my existence. I have not the right to become mired by the deter determinations of the past. <clears throat> Here Fanon associates being with roots, with having a se secure place in the world, with being mired or held by what the past has established. But the black past cannot give him a stable ground or foundation. Similarly, the idea of black civilization cannot provide the assurance of possession, of overcoming the quote, have not, unquote. Both attempt to cover over or cover up the abyss that black bodies have been positioned to represent and protect the non-black world. The tensions and frictions that mark Fanon's relationship with, um, to time can also be felt in the way that Fanon discusses the self, the I that becomes the privileged and repeated pronoun throughout the conclusion. The repetitive self-references to I culminate in a statement that, that riffs on the, on the transcendental subject, I am my own foundation. While this sounds like Fanon is elevating the self as the ground of its own existence, we must remember that white existence has relegated blackness to the edges of being, to, uh, to a zone of non-being, and since Fanon claims that he has been thrown into a world where things are hurtful and his words are fringed with silence, the foundation that Fanon refers to must be wounded, torn, and something like an abyss. Yet this wounded eye is not necessarily stuck or incapacitated. Rather, Fanon claims that a kind of leap through the abyss involves introducing invention into life and imagining a world where creation outstrips confinement and ossification. As mentioned above, quote, Western man, the colonizing subject, is also motivated by the desire to create and discover new things. Therefore, invention is historically intertwined with expansion, possession, and the erasure of beings and entities considered defeat <coughs> or as obstacles right, to discovery and creation. This may explain why Fanon broaches the language of touching. Why not simply try to touch the other, feel the other, discover the other? The act of touching and being touched underscores receptivity and vulnerability in a matter of the logic of, of appropriation disavows. Even if the touch can always become violent, or a violent attempt to clutch or hold the other, Fanon reminds the reader that these violent modes of relating to others are still expressions of the touch, a gesture that exposes the self to the other in the moment of contact. Consequently, Fanon's inventing I is always already tied to, but potentially undone, by intimate relationships with others. The use of the interrogative in the above passage is also significant. Throughout the concluding uh, section, Fanon interweaves questions into his declarations and claims. The interrogative, as Heidegger suggests in being in time, enacts a certain way of relating to the world, of comporting of oneself <coughs> to subject matter. To, I'm sorry, of comporting oneself to subject matter. And as someone who tries to use the interrogative a lot, it gets told by reviewers, you gotta answer some of these questions, but I appreciate the interrogative, right? <laughs> Reviewers don't always appreciate like, the paragraphs of questions, right? But <clears throat> rather than making an, an assertion or a judgment, which often entails a hasty endeavor to project itself onto the world, the familiar onto the unfamiliar, the question can be a slow seeking after and opening up to something. 
The proverbial rhetorical question within a text like Black Skin, White Mask enables the reader to work through tensions, queries, and passive thought without aiming for a resolution. In fact, a series of questions interrupts the reader and asks her to pause, stand still, and reflect. At the same time, these questions elicit a response. They prompt the reader to think, ponder, and imagine without the assurance of a definitive answer. Along these lines, Fanon ends the book by performing a prayer. Oh, my body, always make me a man of questions. In this final prayer, Fanon implores to be made a man, a dubious request, as he has already told the reader that the black is not a man. He's also said the white is not as well. Anticipating winter, Fanon's work shows how Western man both relies on and excludes blackness. He gives us a poignant account of what it means to live the antagonistic relationship between blackness and the human as constructed by Euro-American Euro modernity. At the same time, he also uses the term man throughout the final section and his final prayer to indicate a possibility that is not yet. This new humanity, this alternative sense of man, is defined by the question and perhaps comes into existence by questioning, for instance, the racial and gender dimensions of man, the human, sorry, the racial and gender dimensions of man, the human, and so forth. Finally, Fanon offers this prayer to his questioning body, a body that he has already associated with chains, lashes, and spit, with the tornness and permeability of flesh. By calling this prayer a final prayer, Fanon suggests that we read Black Skin, White Mass as a series of prayers. This I'm getting from a conversation with Professor Carter. And by linking prayer with the black body, Fanon gestures toward an alternative sense of the sacred, a notion of the sacred that has gone astray in the flesh rather than becoming the placeholder for settlement and possessing the earth. Conclusion. Nelson Mandela Torres correctly alludes to a gap between religious studies scholars and those who study race and politics. The former group usually does not consider race and coloniality as central components of modern constructions of religion, while the latter group assumes that religion is already known and figured out. Following Mother Notorious, I have attempted to, to, to bridge this gap by juxtaposing Eliade, Winter, and Fanon. I have argued that a particular notion of the sacred as a signifier for settled territory and imposing a cosmos onto chaos, a notion of the sacred exemplified in Eliade's thought, provides the underpinning and legitimation of colonial projects. While Eliade briefly acknowledges the connection between the world establishing sacred and aversion to the opaque in the flesh, Winter and Fanon show how this antagonism between the sacred for man and blackness organizes and structures the modern world. Because a commitment to the sacred is prevalent in religious and secular projects, but often more subtle in the self-described secular projects, we cannot simply assume that an abandonment of religion and theological grammars will save us from anti-black racism or the afterlife of colonization. Instead, I have argued for, and so here's what I'm saying, right? I'm suggesting that this conception of the sacred is prevalent in both religious and self-described secular projects, right? I think that's, that's. Instead, I have argued for an alternative sense of the sacred defined by excess, dissolution, and anguish. This volatile sacred expressed in Fanon's writings and poetics draws out the disavowed terror of Western man and its redemptive endeavors. It also becomes a site where an author like Fanon can play with language and grammar in the attempt to outline the invention of new forms of intimacy and sociality through wounds and cuts. In, in a contemporary situation where black football players are punished for desecrating the flag, where migrant Latinx workers from the south of the United States are captured and detained because they threaten to obscure the borders between life and death, us and them, purity and contamination, or religious terror is primarily associated with radical Islam rather than imperial state projects of war and expansion, a re-examination of the relationship between race, coloniality, and the sacred may provide glimmers of hope within the current order of things. Thank you.